Melissa Brannon was born on April 12th, 1984 in Texas to Michael and Tammy Brannon. But when she was five years old, her parents divorced and Melissa moved with her mother to Virginia. They were all set to restart their lives with pleasant memories, friendly people, and a new culture. Tammy worked as an accountant and took care of Melissa all by herself. She was super protective of her daughter. They lived in a lovely apartment complex with friendly neighbors and fun parties almost every weekend. On December 3rd, 1989, a Christmas party with approximately 100 guests was taking place at the apartment complex that Melissa and Tammy lived at. At around 10 p.m., Tammy wanted to put Melissa to bed. She asked Melissa to grab her coat and some potato chips while she said her goodbyes. The little girl, dressed in a red skirt and blue Sesame Street sweater, was out of her mother's vision for only a minute. And she never came back. Melissa was there one minute and the next she was gone. When Tammy could not find her daughter, she immediately called the police and filed a complaint. The police arrived at the scene and began searching for Melissa. They questioned people and looked around for clues. While there were no signs of the little girl, there was an open window in the utility room. The police's initial belief was that Melissa climbed out the window and ran outside. They hoped to find her nearby, wandering around. Both the officers and the neighbors began searching the neighborhood. It was a cold December evening. If Melissa had wandered off, chances are she wouldn't make it through the night. Unfortunately, they couldn't find her anywhere. Panic rose in the complex. Everyone was disturbed at the crime that happened right under their noses, and poor Tammy was inconsolable. Melissa was all she lived for, and she failed. She's all I have, a sobbing Brandon said, facing the crush of television cameras gathered outside her apartment the next day. As she read from a piece of paper, her hands shaking uncontrollably, Melissa's grandfather stood by her side. Melissa, if you can get to a telephone, please dial our number like I've taught you to and call home, she said. We love and miss you very much. Please come back to us. Mommy's waiting. Melissa's disappearance rocked the Washington region as hundreds of strangers joined in the massive search for Melissa. Bumper stickers saying, bring Melissa Brandon home for Christmas, were plastered on cars and store windows. Over 300 people helped in the search, but sadly, they couldn't find her. The police knew that there was no time to waste. So the officers decided to question 200 odd residents and employees on the same night. They knocked on every door in the apartment complex and took their statements. And one name kept making an appearance, Caleb Hughes. Now that is some good police work. That is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Caleb was a 23 year old maintenance worker. He was at the party all drunk and vulgar. Many felt uncomfortable and disgruntled to see him lurking around, touching and talking to kids and women inappropriately. So the police realized that Caleb fit the description perfectly of an abductor. The police decided to visit Caleb, whose house was about four miles from the apartment complex itself. Caleb's wife answered the door and told them he didn't come home until 1230 that night, which police found odd. His house was four miles from the apartment complex, and yet it took him almost two and a half hours to get home. When the officers got a hold of Caleb, he casually told them that he was out buying beers, for two hours. Furthermore, Caleb had washed his clothes, sneakers, belt, and knife sheath immediately after coming home. At 12.30 in the morning on a cold December night, needless to say, the knife wasn't with the sheath. Knife missing, washing all your clothes the second you get home. Suspicious. Police found Caleb's attitude dismissive and rude. He didn't have an alibi or proper responses to their questions. When the police took a look at Caleb's clothes that he so desperately wanted to wash, they noticed that the sides of his sneakers were shaved off purposely, as if he was trying to hide or remove something. So the officers decided to conduct a luminol test on Caleb's sneakers and clothes. Despite being just washed, the pair of shoes still had blood traces on them. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough of it to get a match to say if it was Melissa's or not. Since Caleb was acting weird and sketchy, the police brought him in for questioning. Though they kept him in custody for several hours, they got nothing. He even challenged them to prove that he was guilty. Unfortunately, the police had no evidence, and they had to let Caleb go. But they were confident of two things. Melissa was abducted, and Caleb 
was somehow guilty. The police built a 12-mile search radius around the apartment complex and Caleb's house. About 500 volunteers, the police force, military personnel, helicopters, and dive teams scoured the area for Melissa. The police went back to the apartment complex to get a better look, and they focused on the area near the, near the utility room. The officers found a pair of adult footprints that led to the parking lot. So the police theorized that the culprit picked up Melissa, put her in a car, and drove away. It brought them back to Caleb and the two and a half hour journey that fateful night. The police knew they didn't have much to arrest Caleb. So they involved the FBI and the jury to get express court orders for blood tests and forensic data collection. The police also looked into Caleb's history. They found that he was brought up in an abusive, dysfunctional family. He had a lengthy criminal record and a long history of alcohol and drug abuse. However, one piece of information piqued the police's interest. Caleb was a known pedophile. When Melissa was abducted, Caleb was actually out on probation for an auto theft case and he had violated his probationary condition. So the judge canceled his probation and sent him back to prison for about seven to eight months. That gave police enough time to build their case against him. Two months after Melissa went missing, Tammy received a ransom call. The anonymous caller demanded $75,000 the very next day or that they'd harm Melissa. She immediately called the police and her mother to arrange the money. The police assured Tammy that they would help her with the case. They wanted to save Melissa more than anything else. So they asked her to arrange the money while they took care of setting up the exchange. The next day, Tammy dropped the money off at the spot that they told her to. Two young college students came to collect the money, but the agents rounded them up and arrested them. It turned out they didn't have Melissa. They were just looking to make some money. That's fucking cruel, you assholes. God, what is wrong with you? Police turned their attention back to Caleb. The officers found out that the car Caleb drives was his wife's, and she gave them permission to impound it. Usually, the forensics team would use a vacuum cleaner to collect minuscule pieces of evidence. But Caleb's car was an absolute mess with trash, clutter, and dog hair literally everywhere. So checking the entire vehicle was impossible. Instead, the police decided to use Luminol to identify segments to collect evidence. Luminol highlighted the driver's seat, steering wheel, foot pedals, and, and floor mat. The team collected blood samples from these places and sent them in for testing. Unfortunately, the tests were inconclusive because the specimens weren't strong enough. The forensics team then used duct tape to collect hair samples from the seat. While most of it was Caleb's dog hair, the team identified three strands of rabbit hair and a strand of blonde hair. The forensic team conducted tests and they were a perfect match. The rabbit hairs were from Tammy's coat and the blonde hair was Melissa's. Despite finding evidence in the suspect's car, the police still needed more to strengthen their case. The officers feared that Caleb's lawyer would dismiss the case if they only had the hairs because maybe he just brushed past them. Maybe it got in his clothes on accident. That's not enough evidence to prove that Melissa was in the car. So they decided to check the car for forensic evidence. The team found a bunch of red and blue fibers on the passenger seat. They were more interested in the blue threads because they were acrylic. It turned out Melissa was wearing a blue acrylic sweater the night she went missing. And the FBI went above and beyond to make sure the fibers were from Melissa's sweater. The chief officer conducted 8,000 tests to confirm that it was a match. At that point, the police had multiple pieces of evidence pointing to Caleb, but nothing about Melissa's whereabouts. The police had no idea if Melissa was alive or dead. But with the mounting evidence, the blood samples, and the missing knife, they believe that the five-year-old was raped and murdered. The police made Caleb take a polygraph test. The officers wanted him to confess to the murder to charge him. And Caleb pretty much lied through the entire thing. He kept saying the same thing, even though it was a complete and utter lie. Caleb's botched polygraph test meant that the police didn't get the confession that they wanted but they still went ahead and charged him with abduction to intent to defile, which means intention to sexually assault. They could not charge him with murder. They didn't have a body. They didn't have enough evidence to even say 
you know, that he killed her. They didn't have a weapon. They didn't have a body. They didn't have enough blood evidence. So they went with this so they could at least charge him. Sammy even tried talking to Caleb in 1991 after he was convicted. Tammy told the Post that she had spoken with him once, briefly. He did not deny taking my daughter, but he did not confirm it, she said. I told him I knew he had taken my daughter. All I wanted to know is where she was. At one point, I thought he was going to tell me, but he didn't. At trial, Caleb pled not guilty, and his case came to court in February of 1991. After eight days and several hours of deliberation, the jury found Caleb guilty. The judge sentenced him to 50 years in prison. In 1995, a search of a lake was made after a power company worker found some red cloth in the lake, but there was no evidence of a body found. About eight years after Melissa's disappearance, her mother remarried. Although she took on the surname of her new husband, Graybill, as her own, she retained the name Brannon in listings so that her daughter, if she was still alive, could find her. Tammy had raised four stepchildren with her new husband. Tammy declined to have her daughter declared dead, and she maintained hope that Melissa was still alive. Tammy and her father began working with the National Center of for Missing and Exploited Children, which produced an age-progressed picture of Melissa at around 21 years old. The story of her disappearance was told on the FBI files in the eighth episode of the first season. It, was also, it also appeared on an episode of Forensic Files in the fifth episode of the fourth season, entitled In Innocence Lost. However, sadly, Caleb was released from prison on good behavior on August 2nd, 2019, after serving only 29 years of his prison sentence. Luckily, he was made to register as an official sex offender when he got out. That same year of 2019, the 30th anniversary of Melissa's disappearance approached. Fairfax cold case detectives decided to intensify their efforts to find her remains and identify her killer. Releasing new photos of Melissa and her abductor, re-examining the evidence with new technology, and again, appealing for help from the public. The Fairfax police never ceased to amaze me with their dedication to this case, said Tammy Brannon, Melissa's mother. What they're doing and what they've done all along, they've never stopped. Brannon's pain remains constant. It becomes part of the fabric of your life. I miss my daughter every day. It's been 30 years, but that doesn't stop me from missing her. If you have any information regarding Melissa's disappearance, you can call the Fairfax County Police Major Crimes Bureau at 703-246-7800. Tips can also be submitted anonymously online at fairfaxcrimesolvers.org. And sadly, to this day, this case remains unsolved. To conclude, I'm just kind of pissed off. This is one of those cases that kind of just grinds my gears. I hate missing cases, but I also love missing cases because they're intriguing and mysterious because you have no idea what happened. But when it comes to children missing, ooh, that just <laughs> pisses me off because I am the oldest of five siblings and I just don't like the idea of kids getting hurt. Um, I'm very protective of my siblings, so when I see something like that, it's kind of just like... <sighs> so, this guy's a piece of shit. I'm pretty sure Caleb did it. Of course, they don't have the weapon. They didn't get a conclusive test. But, come on. He takes two and a half hours to get home and says he's buying beers. Why? He directly washes all of his clothes and his knife sheath, which his knife is suddenly missing. He shaves off part of his shoes like he's trying to hide something. There is residue blood where he was sitting and on the steering wheel and on the floor mat. There are fibers on the passenger seat from Melissa's hair, her mother's coat, and her sweater, plus some from her skirt. Now, of course, you could say that the fibers were because he bumped up against them. He was being creepy to the children and women there. It's possible he got a little too close and got some hairs on him. Sure. That doesn't explain the two and a half hour uh, missing window. Uh, the instantly washing his clothes when he gets home. The shaving off parts of his shoe. The fact that his knife is suddenly missing. Uh, he's not a good person. His life was not great. He has a criminal record. Uh, and he's a pedophile. He was being creepy to the women and children that night. Melissa wanders off by herself. He sees an opportunity and he goes for it. 
Sadly, her body has never been found. It's possible she's alive. I'm highly doubting it. Um, if he did do it, and all that evidence pointing to him is true and right, she's dead. I don't know where. Hopefully they find her. But it's been so long, I don't know if they will. Caleb continues to say he is innocent. He's not. And it sucks that he was out on good behavior. He deserved 50 years. He deserved forever, in my personal opinion. I'm just glad he served at least most of his sentence of 50. He only served 29 of it, but still nice. And he was made to officially uh, sign up, well, claim that he's a sex offender, which he is. Uh, so now everywhere he goes, people will know that. He tries to get a job, tries to move somewhere, they will know that. So that's at least something. I It just sucks that they couldn't charge him with murder, which is what they should have done. But they didn't have a body. They didn't have a lot of blood evidence. The test came back inconclusive. The hairs weren't enough to convict someone of murder. And he never confessed. The polygraph test showed he was lying, but they couldn't. They didn't get a confession, so they have no idea. Maybe he'll have a deathbed confession where he'll come clean and say what happened to Melissa. Or someone will stumble upon her bones. I don't know. Her mother keeps out hope that she is still alive. And honestly, that would be great news if she was still alive. But I'm... I'm not really, like... Leaning toward that. I, I do not think Melissa's still alive. I do think that Caleb killed her. There's so much weirdness about him. I do think he did it. I hope he confesses or they find something. Because Melissa deserves to be found. She was five years old. Five. No one's life deserves to be cut short. Especially that young. It's just heartbreaking. It's honestly heartbreaking. Hopefully, they find her. It has been over 30 years since she went missing. But maybe we'll get good news one day. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. See you later, guys.